Bending is cool. It's brilliant, really. It helps viewers appreciate the philosophy of movement inherent to different schools of martial arts, while simultaneously being visually stunning full contact magic. The show could have rightfully patted themselves on the back and rested on their laurels, but they didn't. Bending means a lot in the world of Avatar 2 as an element of world building, both to individuals and to society at large. While each of the bending disciplines themselves have a lot to say, here I'll be taking a broad overlook of bending as a whole, and how the show uses the mechanic to explore concepts and themes relevant to our society too. Bending serves as a very fascinating analogy. Still, there's a lot of question about what exactly bending is trying to be an analogy for, and what the show is trying to accomplish with using it as such. The show starts off putting bending into clear focus, showing Katara practicing it in the Southern Water Tribe. Bending is something deeply personal and important to her, that she wants to explore more but can't because she is isolated and thus forced to be self-taught. Her passion for bending is why she wants to journey to the Northern Water Tribe with Aang in the first place, kicking off the entire series. We initially take Katara's alienation to mean that bending is just a rare skill, and her tiny village doesn't have anyone who has held onto the heritage of it. But even this early on of the show, there are signs that it's more sinister than just that, and that bending has been eliminated from her tribe purposefully. Still, some important premises have been set up for us. Non-bending seems to be the norm, with rare people being born as benders. It's also not a strictly hereditary trait, as none of Katara's remaining family have inherited it. Yet it still exists as a unique quality that distinguishes the four nations from each other, and is localized within them, making it double as a cultural signifier. Bending may not be directly hereditary, but which bending you're even capable of is. Aang, for example, being an airbender, reveals his culture and heritage, one that should be extinct, and he is no more able to teach Katara her culture's bending discipline than anyone else's. And despite bending being something you're born with, its potential is only fully realized after years of instruction from your people. In this way, bending is strongly interwound with culture and heritage in the story. Then again, uh, I'd be remiss not to acknowledge that bending makes you physically very formidable. Obviously, bending has a physical might behind it that enables power and autonomy. It's literally superpowers, yeah? The military might of a country is largely dependent on its trained benders, to the point where having its bending taken from it significantly neuters its capacity to even resist. That's why military action is often taken during points where bending is suppressed, as it leaves the nation helpless. To look at bending as power, a good place to start is where bending is suppressed, and where that power is seen as a threat that must be suppressed. Jumping over to Haru's Earth Kingdom village, all the benders are imprisoned, and bending is actively forbidden by the Fire Nation that is occupying their territory, with anyone discovered to be bending taken away to labor camps to have their spirits broken by being isolated from the source of their own cultural power. Here, bending takes on a dual meaning, both of being a cultural practice stamped out by colonization, but also being the physical might of a population and their ability to literally resist. This is also why Katara's village has a dearth of benders. The Fire Nation systemically decimated them, Haru, Katara, and even Aang's bending represents a hope for the future. Since bending inevitably re-emerges in a population and can't be fully stomped out, the Fire Nation cannot fully snuff out resistance. Katara comes face to face with another area bending is suppressed, against women in the Northern Water Tribe. Here bending takes on a similar meaning to being trained for combat, which in many cultures women are forbidden from participating in. Female waterbenders are allowed to be trained in healing, however, having separate less threatening roles while still upholding the gendered cultural traditions of the tribe. While previously bending has been shown as a culture's heritage, here it takes on new meaning when that culture begins denying and policing who is allowed to have access to that empowerment, showing that both external forces upon a culture and the culture itself can deny people's access to bending as a form of control. Bending's combative power, both to subjugate and resist subjugation, also comes up in other areas. One specific place is in bloodbending, a sub-style of waterbending that exists purely to restrict freedom. Its founder, Hama, was one of the waterbenders that the Fire Nation captured from Katara's village. Many bending styles and sub-disciplines reflect the environment people are placed in, but for Hama, she developed bloodbending from her subjugation. Being isolated from all other sources of water, and growing incredibly resentful under her brutal captivity, she created a form of waterbending that turns people into objects by freely manipulating the water inside of them. This practice is treated as taboo. Being willing to bloodbend is treated like it taints your soul, and makes you willing to violate someone's freedom and agency. On a lighter note, the practical technology of most nations rely on their bending, as does their military technology. We can also see bending itself as a technology in how it enables multiple characters to overcome physical disabilities. Toph, like Katara, 
uses bending to overcome confines placed on her by her society, demonstrating bending's capacity for empowerment to overcome limitations. Seeing bending as a form of technology goes all the way back to the time of Juan, where the power of firebending is shown to enable humans to begin settlement, combating the spirits and colonizing the spirit wilds, becoming analogous to Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. Here, the original firebenders are put at odds with the spirits, as fire allows them to fight back against them. But even here, the empowerment of bending is not black and white. The air people are able to use bending in harmony with the spirits. For them, it just enables their mobility and capacity to forage. Bending as power doesn't have to be bending to subjugate. It can just be used as a way to overcome limitations. The origin myth of all schools of bending place it as a gift from the natural world, and spirituality plays a huge role in understanding what bending means to different societies. Bending is not just power and technology. The air nomads largely made do without both, and were a society entirely made up of benders, due apparently to their high spiritual affinity. Mechanically, it seems to have something to do with chi, the energy that moves through the body of those in this world. It can't really be said that benders are inherently more spiritual people from the examples we see throughout the show, but learning to bend is steeped in a degree of spiritual training, and bending itself as a talent seems to be a reflection of a person's potential. But whether or not this potential gets realized as a spiritual and cultural practice comes down to the training itself. Zhang Zhang is an interesting case study. While Katara grew up in isolation from her cultural heritage of bending, Zhang Zhang was actively disgusted by his immersion in his. He grew up in the war-mongering Fire Nation, where firebending has become a tool of destruction that he sees as a curse inflicted upon him. But the show disputes that this is the only way to view firebending. While the current Fire Nation has transformed bending into a tool of violence, other, older Fire Nation cultures saw it as a nurturing, life-giving force, showing how different cultures can have different relationships with the same element, and that the context that you are trained in your element can decide what it means. This is part of why Zhang Zhang considers it so important to learn firebending from a perspective of restraint instead of power, as the mindset shapes what the tool can become. Bending is a quality that is shaped by culture into all sorts of forms at intersections of power, but simultaneously is a deeply personal and liberating force of connection and understanding, which the show deftly uses in all sorts of contexts. Lastly, bending is also a form of personal expression. Different people in different circumstances learn to bend in their own ways, and it lets them be creative. But this also lets bending take on the properties of the individual and their philosophies, insights, and experiences. This allows people to learn to bend as a way to learn different philosophies and ideas as well, as a form of cultural exchange. This could even be considered the premise of the entire show itself. Learning the elements is traveling the world to experience different cultures, beliefs, and practices as enrichment and rounding out your own worldview. You don't even need to be a bender to participate in this process, and it is the vessel of a lot of the show's themes around being willing to grow and change from the teachers around you, the past, and even from nature itself. And that basically covers it, yeah? It's a fluid metaphor for tradition, power, and spirituality, and how it manifests in relationship to the war-torn society of the Avatar universe. Bingo bango, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Right. So... Why do non-benders exist? What do you think it adds to the show to have people who can't bend? Well, let's see. It bridges the gap into our world some, and lets real people without power place themselves within the conflicts of the story. Non-benders also give a place for strategy against an asymmetrically powerful foe, and show that you can still wield a kind of power even if you aren't physically formidable. Narratively, the inclusion of non-benders lets there be a population who are powerless when the Fire Nation invades, especially since most capable adult benders, being the military force, have left their town to participate in the larger war effort. And non-benders make up the majority of the populace in three out of four of the nations. Non-benders are the common man, they are the masses, and they are often those who are most vulnerable to being acted upon by the benders of the political order. Which brings us to the Legend of Korra. Okay, before, before we start getting into Amon, let's just send some political context. This seed about non-benders becomes the center stage once we get to Legend of Korra, and the rest of this essay is going to be about the first season of the show, where non-bending really takes center stage. But to begin understanding the non-benders, we gotta talk about Republic City. Republic City is a post-colonial society made up of people from all nations, and thus governed by a council of people appointed by each nation. The UN controls them essentially, 
the citizens don't get to choose their lawmakers and representatives. And remember, the vast majority of those citizens are non-benders. The city is incredibly stratified, with different nationalities congregating in their own districts. Further, benders and non-benders are also divided largely into different neighborhoods. In a huge departure from the original series, it's very easy for non-benders and benders to be separated from each other along class lines their whole lives. The Dragon Flats borough is one such non-bending neighborhood, drawing a lot of inspiration from 1980s Queens. The borough is the birthplace of automotive mongol Hiroshi Sato, as well as the formal location of training facilities for the Chi Blockers. It's one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city, and a location where the triad bending gangs compete over territories, allegiances, and new recruits. Which, ultimately, results in their being poor, ghettoed, non-bending districts that are largely treated as politically disposable by the government. And it's here that the Equalists, a movement against bending itself, found fertile soil. Soil that, apparently, the Equalist leader Amon single-handedly molded into a political threat. The Equalists see bending as fundamentally oppressive and seek to equalize their society by removing bending from it entirely. To fight back, the Equalists employ a technique called Chi blocking that temporarily disables a person's ability to bend. This along with their technology lets them fight back against the benders. Even in the original series, Chi blocking is portrayed as somewhat horrifying to Katara as it cuts her off from her bending and all that bending means to her. But obviously, it alone isn't enough to transform the world in the way that the Equalists want. Luckily, their leader Amon has the perfect ability to deal with benders. Amon can permanently remove people's bending through a kind of spiritual lobotomy. He claims it's a gift from the spirits, but actually, Amon is secretly an exceptionally powerful bloodbender. Which is rather telling, as bloodbending is considered an inherently corrupting force of subjugation. Which makes a lot of sense of the parallels it draws to violating others. But that does bring us neatly back to the larger point. What is bending being used as a metaphor for here? And does Amon have a point? Should bending be eliminated? First off, now that we're getting into the actual meat of the story, I think we need to address why the Equalists are difficult to talk about. There's a difference between what social factors logically make sense to exist in a conflict, and which one the show actually chooses to legitimize. The logical consequences of randomly, magically empowered individuals isn't what's being analyzed in the story. We don't see random Republic City citizens scared for their safety around children with pyrokinesis, or that someone will fire icicles at you if they get mad. As far as we are shown, the actual power with benders is that they exist as a privileged class institutionally, not that they are terrifying demigods who could destroy your house with a thought. The metal bending police and gangs might as well be using handguns for all that bending powers themselves matter. The superpowers aren't the point. What the show cares about is the social power that comes with being on top of your society. But to talk about whether or not non-benders are really oppressed, let's examine the places bending has in Republic City. An easy place to start is pro-bending. Pro-bending is a prominent sport in Republic City that draws a lot of inspiration from boxing. It's a poor people sport, in which fighters bleed for the entertainment of others. As opposed to a leisure sport like golf, where you need money and free time to enjoy. Blood sports are also one of the main ways poor people, and especially black and brown kids, can get a leg up in their society. Particularly in the time period that Republic City draws inspiration from, where it was broadcast over the radio to reach poorer neighborhoods. At the same time, pro-bending shows how valorized bending is in the world of Avatar. Amon explicitly criticizes the city's worship of the sport, even when the games are obviously rigged. There's a lot of money riding on games, both in gambling, but also in how the payout to the winners is huge, big enough to let the effectively homeless Mako and Bolin not need to join a gang for work. It serves as an out to poverty that they had access to because they were benders. And yeah, the gangs. Known in-universe as triads, they are organized crime groups of benders that control poor areas of the city. Many triads only recruit one type of bender, their people, and most of them completely exclude non-benders from membership while simultaneously using their power to extort those non-benders. The gangs often engage in turf wars in the streets and act as hired muscles for those willing to pay them. This, like pro-bending, gives benders a way to climb up in their society. Simultaneously though, the gangs are the source of most of the animosity towards benders. Likely it was them who killed Hiroshi Sato's wife for instance. They stroke a lot of conflict between benders and non-benders, by being a very prominent place where bending oppression hurts others. Although in the show, they aren't the only group who explicitly oppress non-benders. That's right, the Metal Bending Police Corps. The thin blue line is here. You don't need to be a metal bender to join the police, but it does allow you to be in their elite squadron, and the greater police force in Republic City seems 
to exist solely to provide support for the metal benders. In this context, their bending represents their state-backed monopoly on violence, with even other benders not allowed to use their bending to interfere in police action. Despite that power, the police are repeatedly shown to be self-serving. Our introduction to the police is through Republic City's chief of police, Lin Beifong, who extols how she won't give the arrested Cora special privileges moments before lettering her out scot-free as a personal favor to Tenzin. Later we were shown Lin happily turning towards vigilante justice, and apparently was cozy with the idea of coming up with a pretense to arrest the non-bender Pema out of personal grievances. Much later we are even shown that Toph, the paragon of the police, explicitly covered up crimes when it inconvenienced her personally. Like, the police freely break their own rules when it suits them. And we're also shown that when the good cop Lin is out of power, the bad cops are fully willing to wield their state violence to oppress non-bender neighborhoods. In a surprisingly realistic depiction of how criminality can be manufactured on the spot with curfews, resisting arrest, and impeding police business, the metal bending police force serves power, not the population. And most of that population are powerless non-benders. And finally, we get to the people who actually make the laws that the police are enforcing. The highest seat of power shown to us is the council, composed of non-elected representatives from the composite nations of the city. Aside from Tarlock, a bad politician, and Tenzin, a good politician, the council members are more or less just privileged, vacuous NPCs who do whatever Tarlock says. He probably is blackmailing them, who knows. They democratically vote on legislation amongst themselves, which always goes in Tarlock's favor. Incidentally, all of them are benders, but being bender is not a requirement, which may suggest that there are unmentioned systemic forces that bias benders towards being the ones who make it to the top. It also might suggest why the council on the whole, including Tenzin, are largely unsympathetic to the Equalists, despite the Equalists being part of the people that they are elected to govern, and why the Equalists are treated like an incursion threat rather than their fellow citizens abandoned by the social order. So, given all that political context, what metaphors are we drawing from here, huh? Well, I think the most straightforward direction, and the one that the show invites us to take, is to see bending through a Marxist analysis of capitalist social classes. Amon and his movement take enormous visual inspiration from the iconography of communist revolutionary movements. Not to mention, the idea of the equalists as secret agents hidden among us very much alludes to Red Scare fears. However, the series does not cleanly associate non-benders with the working class, or benders with the owner class or appreciably demonstrate the actual critique that comes with the analysis of capitalism. A Marxist analysis would frame class and power through its relationships to the means of production. However, Hiroshi Sato, a non-bender, is the only person we meet who is unambiguously a member of the owner class. And the most clean-cut example of someone in the worker class is Mako, whose factory job is based on extracting value from his bending. While the Equalist movement uses anti-capitalist aesthetic, capitalism is portrayed as the only way non-benders like Hiroshi Sato was ever able to accumulate power in the first place, and the mechanisms of it are not put in the spotlight as the actual problems during the show. Well, if the movement doesn't follow along those specific class lines, perhaps more broadly economic ones? The Equalist name calls to mind economic inequality and the Occupy movement. And certainly, there is a problem of poor non-bender districts against wealthy elite benders. But a pure economic analysis is even more explicitly refuted throughout the show. The main cast, for example, are very pointedly made up of the inverse. Impoverished benders and a privileged non-bender, actively drawing attention to how bending does not map onto economic outcome. Whatever bending is, the show does not think of wealth as the core of the issue. Something with a lot more substance is analyzing bending in terms of political power. All institutions of power and leadership in Legend of Korra Season 1 are effectively composed of benders. Bending definitely does seem like, if nothing else, it makes it easier to achieve power through opportunities that bending gives you. The oppressors at the top of their society also tend to be benders even if not all benders end up on top of society. Hiroshi Sato is the exception that proves the rule. He grew up in the Dragon Flats borough, but managed to accumulate power not due to his non-bending status, but in spite of it, and he recognized it as such. He achieved the American dream and overcame hardships, and yet still benders harmed his life and family, harm that his wealth didn't protect him from. Because of who Hiroshi Sato was born as, he had a lot less power to defend himself in his society. Which gets us to probably the most contentious way to read the situation, the one that most prominently places inherent political privilege as the center note. Is it race? Is, is, is this a race thing? Like, that can't possibly be right. As we've established, benders can be born from non-benders, 
Non-benders can be born from benders. It goes so far that bending isn't a given even if you're born as genetic twins. That's as clear cut as it gets that it's not a purely genetic phenotypical thing. Well, someone should have told Legend of Korra that because they sure treat it like it's hereditary. I'd like you to, for a moment, look at Legend of Korra season one in isolation. For the duration of the season, there are no examples of bending not being a strictly hereditary quality. Like, take the aforementioned non-bending districts. Why are there no benders there? How are there entire residential ghettos of non-bending families? I can come up with some explanations of why, but the show doesn't tell you any. There are no relevant examples of non-bender kids from bender families, or vice versa. If a parent is a bender, the kids will be benders too, and there is zero mention of the impact the Equalist movement would have on family structures where this isn't the case. This is also the season that introduced a family with a strong line of blood bending, defying all conventions of established norms of how bending works, which was a massive departure in how bending proficiency was understood as based on insight and training. Seeing bending as race also makes sense of a lot of strange choices, such as putting such a huge focus on how bending and economics are not a one-to-one -one correlation, and things like Hiroshi Sato disgusted as Asami for dating a dirty bender with a hard B. Viewing bending as race is also consistent with other things, like the heavy bias towards the political and police force being made up of benders. If you're reading them as white people, you could say it's that political power works for them, even when they're in poverty. Of course, all of this is to say nothing about the active messages of injustice present in the season, which, oh boy, would put the Equalists as a radical racial liberation movement essentially starting a race war. Which is an analogy the show certainly doesn't equip itself to handle in earnest, especially given there is no sense of a longer lasting legacy or history of non-bender oppression as an underclass, or what it would even mean in terms of reparations. Like, ultimately, much like the original series, they're trying to make bending a stand-in for all of these things at once. It's not just one of them. And it's trying to blend a lot of concepts informed by these ideas. It doesn't have to pick just one thing for bending to represent, and it it really shouldn't, as we just went over. Most broadly, we can say that bending here represents inherent privilege. But if all this is what bending represents, the show also invites another question. With all this in mind, what does it mean to lose your bending? So, the Equalists think bending is an inherently unjust aspect of their society. And by now, it's not hard to see where they're coming from. When Korra first arrives in Republic City, she doesn't really understand the Equalists. Boy, is it clear that she doesn't understand the Equalists. Korra is someone who has defined herself since she was a child by her bending, which is here read as privilege and power, and these things have always come easy to her, as they are tied to her identity as the Avatar. The very thought of being brought down to normal, like everyone else, is utterly terrifying to her. Bending isn't a spiritual or cultural thing for her so much as a source of her self-worth. And thus, she experiences Amon threatening her bending as extremely traumatic, like someone who is an athletic swimmer becoming paraplegic. When she does inevitably lose her bending, she falls into a deep depression, but not everyone reacts the same way. Of course, this isn't the first or only time in the series taking away someone's bending comes up. Aang takes away Ozai's bending, and it isn't compared to some psychic violation. Rather, it's a humane way to neutralize someone as a threat. It's justice against someone who has unjustly been using their bending to harm others. The camera doesn't sympathize with the victim. Taking away someone's bending isn't portrayed as inherently unjust here. Meanwhile, most of Amon's use of his bending removing powers is framed negatively. When Lin loses her bending, it's treated more like an execution. It's not a more just alternative to killing, but directly made analogous to it. But many cases are portrayed more neutrally, such as when he takes away Tarlock or gang members' bending. Korra never gives bending back to the gang leaders Amon disempowers, despite it being an extremely traumatic thing to do to a bender. The show seems to suggest bending as a privilege should sometimes be taken away, but only if it is actively abused. And even goes so far as to say that bending should be returned to those who the show believes is using it responsibly, namely the police and the Avatar, and not those who don't. Notably, the same people the show thinks should lose their bending are people the show is comfortable imprisoning. Bending as a privilege is something society has the right to take away from you, in the same way it has the right to take away your freedom. If bending is an inherent privilege, the state gets to pick and choose who gets to keep that privilege. Which seems rather hypocritical. So, is Amon right? No, obviously not. The show makes that abundantly clear. The guy who ties up innocent children to suffer as public spectacle is not right. Amon is cartoonishly evil. Because, the Equalists ultimately are not actually a social justice movement. No social justice movement seeks to rob people of their inherent privileges outside the mind of conservative boogeymen. The Equalists are a political cult of personality shepherded under social grievances. 
Despite taking inspiration from New York ghettos, this part of Amon is much more Taiping Rebellion, and Amon's power-seeking tendencies do reflect real-life instances of historical authoritarian communist movements becoming despotic, which seems to be the primary inspiration for this phase of his plan, where he is essentially throwing a coup. Not like we learn anything about what kind of government he intends to set up, but I digress. There could even be an argument Amon is drawing more from fascist movements than communist ones. Why are there no benders allied to the equalist cause besides Amon himself? It's practically a white power movement in how much they hate benders. However, no matter how much the equalists undermine themselves by kicking puppies, I think the show actually agrees with the equalists more often than is acknowledged. Like we've already mentioned, the show concedes that sometimes people should lose their bending. At some points, Amon's even the more moderate one. Korra seemed down to straight up kill Tarlock, while Amon merely wanted to remove his bending. He just extends who he thinks should lose their bending too well. All benders. And we do learn that Amon is seemingly sincere in considering bending to be fundamentally unjust. It's just the show is only willing to concede that certain examples of abuse are too far. It certainly disagrees when Amon goes for the ethnic cleansing route of the airbenders, which ultimately would do fuck all to create a more equitable society. With all this in mind though, in universe? The equalist broad grievances against benders are honestly largely illegitimate. Bending is a dimension that power imprints itself upon, but viewing it as the crux of the issue itself misses the point. The real problem at the heart of the conflict is that their society doesn't actually care for the masses, bender or otherwise. It's just especially willing to treat non-benders as disposable. But that's not because benders exist. The fact is, poverty and homelessness, and being abandoned by your society, is a huge problem among benders too. That's why there's so many benders in gangs in the first place. Benders might make up the people at the very top, but there's a lot of them at the bottom too. And apparently, in those homeless communities at the bottom, free of the existing structures of inequity, there is no conflict due to bending itself. The equalists are using bending as a scapegoat to explain a society that fundamentally doesn't serve its people. But bending as a trait doesn't inherently create injustice, the social context privileging it does. And that social context is what needs to change. Removing bending doesn't solve the issue of an underclass, as we can see in our real life, where bending doesn't exist. A world without bending is not a world without war, police brutality, or gang violence as Amon seems to think. The season, also oddly, never engages with bending's capacity to be more than just a source of inequity, which is a big topic in the previous series and a larger problem with Amon's narrow worldview. It's honestly bizarre that a story where the antagonist wants to remove all bending doesn't actually make a case for why bending is good and necessary. The original series does, where bending is made inherent to a person's agency and self-empowerment, but in Legend of Korra, benders are compared to a privileged race of people sitting atop of society, yet at the same time is comfortable implying that losing your bending is tantamount to rape, or execution, or genocide. That is an enormous narrative tension that never gets resolved, or even discussed. And hey, there is a case to be made for bending. Unlike wealth or political privilege, bending isn't a power that inherently exists at the expense of someone else. But the story makes no defense of it. The vast majority of people are non-benders. Turning benders into non-benders is at least not obviously inhumane without a case being made against it. And without that, all we see is bending existing solely at the expense of non-benders, which sure makes Amon look pretty compelling. Certainly, bending still retains some of its value from the original series. Pro-bending and airbending training help round out Korra's narrow worldview. And to the show's credit, the airbenders are repeatedly positioned as foils to Amon, and the airbender culture themselves are largely unproblematic. Although it's easy to be unproblematic when you have a private, insulated island to occupy. But never does anyone actually make a defense of why the airbender's positive qualities are inherently in conflict with Amon and his worldview. And without making a case of bending being more than a tool of oppression, the season ultimately concludes as a defense of the atrocious status quo, not a criticism of it. Merely a story about stopping dangerous, manipulative individuals threatening to rupture a golden but fragile society. Which would have been all well and good if we didn't get shown how non-benders are objectively oppressed under the current social order. The non-benders never get to articulate specific demands that they want addressed. We aren't shown any open benders being part of the equalists, supporting their movement, or working together towards a common cause. And apparently, the equalist movement was so ideologically shallow 
that it dissolved the moment Amon was revealed a hypocrite. And of course, the fact that Amon was lying to all of them undermines the goals of the movement itself. There's no discussion of the fact that bending could have liberatory potential for non-benders, despite bending literally being the tool Amon uses to push the movement. Or that benders themselves also suffer under the existing status quo, with Mako and Bolin literally being homeless kids. Amon's backstory could even be argued to show how bending harms benders, in the same way that patriarchy harms men. There is no non-violent wing of the Equalists, showing a more sympathetic angle to their activism. There is none of this basis for a story where real social injustice is being fought for by diverse people in an unfair world. Because according to the show, the status quo ultimately was fine. Benders and non-benders don't really have a problem. It's just a demagogue creating problems out of a misaligned fold in the social order to accumulate power. The epilogue at least concedes that there were issues, but wraps them up off-screen in a somewhat cowardly way. You see, Social reform happens by the willing grace of those in power. The council peacefully disbanded themselves without incident to create a presidency where non-benders could elect who they wanted. The police themselves are untouched, and they only acted badly in response to the Equalists. But now that Tarlock is gone, and Lynn is back in power, things are fine. We just needed the right people in charge. And this is where, most charitably, we reach the limits of metaphor. As bending, and the story that surrounds it cannot accommodate the allegorical weight it's trying to hold, and it collapses into a ton of horrible implications. Given that implication is the only place it's willing to actually confront the substance of the problems non-benders face. And like, the ending of the story honestly makes enough logical sense. If you take the conflict to really have just been misdirected frustration from the masses at not having political representation, who are then scapegoating the bender minority over representation in positions of power, President Raiko is a perfectly adequate solution to that problem. But the story doesn't set that up as the actual issue. The actual issue was the existence of far bigger institutional biases that treat them as a lower class. The idea that the issue is one of representation isn't even drawing from the show itself. All the evidence for it is left to paratextual material. Most people don't even know that the council was unelected, let alone that it was composed entirely of benders, which makes the switch over to a presidency fall rather flat if not an active non sequitur. If bending here is just unearned privilege, the show concludes that political representation is what was needed for the underprivileged, despite that not being made relevant to most of the injustices non-benders experienced in the story. The story is, if nothing else, ambitious. But there's a lot of responsibility that comes with making bending a metaphor for so many things at once, and then being unwilling to actually engage with the implications that are required of doing so. The remainder of Korra, past season 1, is thankfully enormously more responsible and humble with the metaphors it uses for bending. But personally, I still think there's a lot of potential that went to waste with the setup of season one. So I'd like to end with a little bit of a call to action, some food for thought. How would you restructure the story to fulfill the metaphors the season sets up? Why do you think bending as an ambiguous metaphor works in the original series but became so controversial in the case of Amon? Do you even agree with the premise of the question? And finally, what works do you believe succeed in telling this alternative style of story about finding societal justice and coming to understand the movement of a radicalized underclass? There's a lot of topics I needed to exclude from this video for a number of reasons. I'm going to list a couple of them on screen just in case you find them of interest. And on that note, I'm genuinely looking forward to what you guys have to say. Take care.